OK, so welcome everybody um, to this School for Primary Care Research funded workshop. Um, it's the second in the workshops around drugs and mental health. And today we're going to focus on bipolar disorder. Just to remind you that uh, this is being recorded and we will be putting out an edited version of the workshop. So not including the breakout rooms, but including the, the main talks, presentations and discussion on the SPCR website. So if you feel uncomfortable with being recorded but want to participate, then just turn your camera off if that's OK. Um, we thought we'd start off by doing some introductions, going around the, the room, the virtual room, just saying who you are, um, particularly if you're a lay participant, um, and what you want to get out of this um, this workshop. So I'll start. I'm Carolyn Cher Graham. I'm a GP in Manchester, Professor of General Practice Research at Keele University. And I will go round my screen, but shout up if I miss you out. Michelle. Hi, I'm um, a research administrator, hopefully nice attempted to um, facilitate uh, this meeting a little bit. Work in the School of Medicine at Keele University. Thanks, Michelle. Ian? Hi, I'm Ian Maidman. I'm a reader in clinical pharmacy, Aston. I guess what I'm hoping to get out from this is to help um, other people to develop research careers. Um, and there are a number of pharmacists on this, names I recognise, which I think is quite good. So I'd encourage, um, obviously there's an interest from pharmacists here, and it's to help them take the first step, which is often the most daunting, I think. Thanks, Ian. David. Hi, excuse me. Hi, David Kessler. I'm a very recently retired GP. I'm uh, a, a, an academic at Bristol University, a professor of primary care, and um, very interested in, in depression and, and other related disorders in my research. I think for me, it will be very interesting to hear the views of a, a broader group of people than that that I'm used to listening to. I'm often talking to other doctors or academics, so it's it, 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 it's uh, it's it's going to be interesting for me. Stuart. Uh, yes, I'm. Um, that's Colin. I'm Stuart Watson. I'm a psychiatrist uh, based in Newcastle. I um, spend half my time or half my funding comes from the NHS, uh, and I've worked in inpatient psychiatry f um, for a long, long time. And I work in the specialist mood disorder service. Um, and the other half, I'm um, university, and I um, do research into, uh, I suppose, causes and treatments in in mood disorders. Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Morgan. I'm a research fellow based at the Centre of Primary Care at Manchester University. Um, I deal with big data, primary care data, uh, answering many uh, sort of mental health questions, and I've finished a project on bipolar disorder. Um, I'm very much interested in sort of taking this work further potentially um, and like everyone talking to other people from different areas. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Kingston. I'm a lecturer in mental health and wellbeing at School of Medicine at Keel. Um, so background in mental health research, I'm a social scientist by background, haven't really covered bipolar disorder in a great amount of detail, so I'm looking forward to learning something new today. Thank you, Ruth. Hi, uh, I'm Ruth Ambrose. I'm a mental health advanced clinical practitioner based in primary care in Bolton. Um, I've recently been awarded an NIHR Individual Research Award, um, my interest being physical health in um, with people with severe and enduring mental health um, problems. So this is just a good opportunity, really, a bit of a recap and a network. That's great. And certainly the aim of, of one of the aims of these workshops is around networking. So hopefully people will make contacts today that, that they can take forward. Sonia. Um, um, Sonia, I'm a pharmacist on the inpatient wards at um, Lanchester Road Hospital in Durham um, and I've just been awarded some scholarship to do a master's with Ian at, at Aston so we're just kind of going to start that imminently so Ian thought it would be quite good to get involved in, in this group. Fantastic, thank you. Matthew. 
Hello, um, I work with the same trust as Sonia, TSS and Weir Valleys, but I'm a community based pharmacist um, working in Harrogate um, and liaising with the CMHTs um, across Hamilton and Richmond as well. Um, previously done the Aston course, um, but I'm interested in the kind of the clinical academic progression rather than managerial progression, which unfortunately in, in mental health, there isn't a huge amount. Lots of uh, consultant pharmacists in other fields, but not so much in mental health. So I'm curious to see how that might be developed in our trust. Thanks, Matthew. Chili? Hi, I'm, I'm Chili. I'm a pharmacist here in Livewell in Plymouth. Um, Join this because um, I just want to find out more about what's happening out there in the bipolar world. Great, thank you, Chili. Um, I'm just trying to click on people's names. My Teams isn't playing playing games. So, is it Aid? Hi, all. My name's Ada DK. I'm pharmacist, senior clinical pharmacist, working with uh, the CAM service. NHS Fife in Scotland and my my expectation of this um, training is to um, have a knowledge of the updates in managing bipolar although we don't get that many bipolar in children but I think we are having a few presentation in the younger adults just now. Thank you. Um, I've got Jay Linfoot. Hi, uh, um, my name's Jodie. I'm a pharmacy technician. I also work for Tees Esk and Weir Valleys, um, working with the community mental health teams. Hi, Jodie. Um, I've got Liz Whitehurst. Hello there, I'm a lay member. Uh, I, um, my son died uh, of, uh, of a suicide uh, eight years ago. Uh, having been diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder in the previous year and having uh, um, having had uh, engagement with the mental health services for about 10 years prior. I'm also myself, uh, I'm a person with lived experience of mood disorders um, lifetime wise. And my, 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 uh, my reason for being here is to uh, um to reduce the risk of um, suicide and uh, to improve the diagnosis of bipolar and uh, disorder and um, to improve the uh, well-being and quality of life for people with mood disorders many thanks liz for for sharing that with us and welcome um, I am really struggling with teams, so I can't identify the who the plus four are. So, if anybody can see the list of participants, and there are four people who I've not been able to introduce because I can't see them, can anybody take over from me and, go, and just go down the list? We've got a hand from some, one of the plus four. Please shout up. Hi, I am Ister. I am a mental health pharmacist from Southwest London. Um, for the last three years, I've been uh, working developing medicines optimization service for people with learning disabilities and autistic people. And my interest here is sort of the, the presentation can be even more difficult in people with learning disabilities to tell apart what's going on. So and and also a catch up um, because I haven't been I haven't worked on on acute wards for about three years now. So it will be great to have a catch up. Thank you so much. Um... I've got a, an an I'll ML. Go yeah, hi, I'm I'm ML. So I'll go. Uh, my name's Michelle Ladd. I'm a lead education and training pharmacist for Derbyshire Healthcare. Um, I'm here because yeah, part of my job is ultimately to try and stay as up to date as possible in all the areas, so I can help upskill not just pharmacy but actually all of the healthcare professionals in in the trust. Um, and obviously we deal with a lot of bipolar learning difficulties and stuff. So yeah. Thank you. Is there anybody who's not introduced themselves and just, I think, put Sarah, your camera on in Sarah show. McCartney, we've not had yet. 
Hi, yeah, yeah, sorry, I just put my hand up there. My name is Sarah McCartney um, and I am a mental health pharmacist working within the community mental health teams um, as part of CNWL. And um, so, yeah, I just I have an interest as well just to learn more about this topic. So that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Somebody with initials AN has now appeared. Can you pop your camera on and introduce yourself? I think is that still Asty? Right. Have we, I think, is I think anybody? I'm really sorry. I've just got this little right. blue circle going on. Is there anybody who hasn't introduced themselves? So I think we've covered everybody. So sorry about that. So hopefully this opportunity, this this workshop will be provide people with an opportunity to network, to have an update from David and Stuart but also to think about what the next research questions are, take them forward and hopefully develop some collaborations. So I'm going to hand over to David and Stuart to give us an update on bipolar disorder. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm, I'm uh, as I said, I'm a, I, well, I have been until recently a GP. My interest in bipolar from a research point of view is recently is pretty recent and Stuart's behind that because he invited me to join a, a project that he's running and I'm very pleased to, to, to have his expertise here. I'm going to talk in a general way about bipolar 1 and 2 and diagnosis and I noticed an awful lot of pharmacists so I think you know, there is stuff about drugs in here, but maybe not as much as you might want. Um, so please, let's talk about drugs as well. But also there's a broad, there's lots of broad things to talk about. And I think there's lots of uncertainties in this area. And also, I apologise in advance if my language is too medical or too technical or people don't, aren't familiar with any terms. You know, it's going to be difficult if we were in a in a real room together you could just put your hand up and say stop I don't know what you mean we can't do that so please store it up and let's let's talk about it and, and sort things out at the end if there's if there's stuff you're not happy about or not clear about folks but, can use the hand function and are you happy yeah, you can do yeah. if you want to I'll stop I'll stop in the middle and and we can um we can do that. We can do it that way. But I, I only get on my very small laptop. I only get a tiny little screen, so I may not see your hand. I will monitor the hands, but I can't monitor the chats because I don't have access to it. I've got the blue circle. So if anybody else has got access to the chat, I think, Stuart, you said you might have that. I'm, I'm all over the chat, Carolyn. Leave Lovely. that with me. Stuart. Thanks. <laughs> Thank well, stop me, Stuart. Why don't you stop me or Carolyn, stop me if you think people are saying, what's going on? What are you talking about? Um. And then I'm going to talk for a bit and I'm going to whiz through these slides and, and then Stuart's going to answer all the hard questions. So that's us. And this is a little ad for the workshop. A hand up already from Liz. OK, Liz. You're on mute, Liz. Speak. <laughs> uh, now, we, we missed that, Liz, because you, you were you were muted, but oh, yeah. I, 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 I just want to say, Sorry. yeah, I thought it was. I just want to say that that um, not dismissing anybody else on this call because everybody's important, but 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 th it's got to meet your needs particularly. So if uh, if any of us wander off track and you think actually this isn't relevant or you're missing something or I'm not getting what you're saying, um, uh, do shout out. Uh, yeah. I, I say that to everybody, but I say that particularly to you, Liz. So shall I shall I go on? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. There's how common is bipolar? And it it's 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 this is really unclear. And I've just put up these rather sort of dry looking numbers just to show you. First of all, there's a spectrum in bipolar, which we know, and that's what we're going to talk about a bit today. But also that there's these two big studies, one in, uh, you know, both in sort of pretty reputable journals, although the first one's more famous. The point is 
they give pretty diff different estimates of how much bipolar there is around. And it's, it, I think the important message to take away is this area is not cut and dried. Um, there's a lot of mood disorder, cycling mood disorders. And I think um, that's what we're going to be looking at today and thinking about. And I pro always approach things from the primary care and community perspective, because that's where I live. And that's where I've always worked. Uh, apart from I did have psychiatric training, but that's a long time ago now. So I've got two questions that I'm going to address about bipolar in primary care, which is, is it underdiagnosed? So Smith and his colleagues in the British Journal of Psychiatry about 12 years ago or 10, 11 years ago, thought it was underdiagnosed. We're missing a lot of people. Zimmerman in the BMJ at about the same time says it's overdiagnosed. And he has a hospital outpatient study from the US to prove it. So who are you going to believe? Let's talk about underdiagnosis first. What might bipolar look like if we're missing it in primary care? And I think the answer probably is depression. It looks like depression because about half of those people with bipolar are, are, are depressed at a at six months after diagnosis, often because treatment hasn't been really good for them. Now, any GP will tell you that there's an awful lot of non-response to treatment in depression in primary care, probably about 50%, and maybe bipolar, undiagnosed bipolar contributes to this. Does it matter? Well, that's you, you know, you want to say yes, and I think it really does matter. Um, it's not the same looking after someone with depression and looking after someone with bipolar. It's really not the same. Uh, there's lots of reasons why it's not the same, but one very obvious thing is antidepressant monotherapy. That's simply giving somebody an antidepressant doesn't really work in bipolar, whereas it's often quite helpful in depression. There's lots of other things we could talk about. We haven't got time right now. People with bipolar die early. It's not just suicide, although that's obviously a terrible event, but it's also from other physical illnesses. And GPs have a very important role, I hope, in trying to prevent suicide and also in improving medical management of people with serious and enduring medical illnesses. Mental illness is a bigger part. And I think as we all would recognize, underdiagnosed mania or hypomania, which is a lesser form of mania, but nonetheless very disruptive, can have really serious consequences on a person's life. They can get them in trouble with all sorts of people, including the police. They can uh, lead to a debt and even prison. So, I mean, it really is a problem. So what about overdiagnosis? Why, how might this happen? Well, this is fuzzier for me, but Bipolar is a diagnosis that historically many doctors and patients have felt comfortable with, and that's certainly true in the US. I don't know how true that is in the UK, but culturally it's a thing in the US. Doctors like it because you can give people drugs for it. There is an overlap between bipolar and other causes of cycling or unstable mood. For example, bipolar 2, often overlaps with, or is easily confused, with borderline personality disorder, or also called emotionally unstable personality disorder, <laughs> and cyclothymia. I'll talk about these conditions in a minute. Again, does overdiagnosis matter? Well, drugs are given long term for bipolar, and drugs have adverse effects. Drugs don't help people with borderline and people with cyclothymia don't need mood stabilizers, and these are standard bipolar treatments. So yeah, it does matter. Also, it matters to have a label that doesn't belong to you, to have a disease label. 
and that's a that's a, a very important thing. So what are the problems with bipolar two? Because I think with bipolar one, an episode of full blown mania, it's not hard to spot. Um, I don't think it's it's easy to miss that. But diagnosis to get a diagnosis of bipolar two requires only an episode of hypomania, which is a less severe and shorter version of elated mood and behavioural disruption. Patients don't always tell doctors or anybody else about their episodes of elevated mood. Um, uh, and it's 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 not always easy to define when a, a, an elevated mood is a pathological thing. So how do we distinguish between these different conditions that I've mentioned, cyclothymia, borderline and bipolar? Here's some boring definitions for you, bipolar one. These are the two, these DSM-5 stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, ICD-10 stands for International Classification of Disease. These are parallel, slightly rivalrous diagnostic symptoms in the world of psychiatry. You don't have to know about these, but they're there. And they say slightly different things, which is annoying. Um, DSM, which is the American one, says you've got to have at least an episode of mania for bipolar one. Proper old fashioned manic depression. ICD-10 says you've got to have mania and something else. Maybe you've been hypomanic, maybe you've been manic again, or maybe you've been depressed. When it comes to bipolar two, they're closer together. You've got to have a major depressive episode to get that diagnosis. And you've got to have a hypomanic that is this less severe um, uh, episode as well, uh, which lasts at least four days. Now, what's mania? It's where you're restless, you're euphoric, you're sleepless, you take risks, you're uninhibited, disinhibited, and you often end up in hospital. A cyclothymia, something that's implicated in the overdiagnosis of bipolar, you've got to have at least two, to get that diagnosis, you should have at least two years of an unstable mood. You might have hypomania, um, but your low mood is not severe. It's it's low, but it's not severe. Personality disorder and bipolar two can also be muddled up and do crossover because people with emotionally unstable personality disorder or borderline personality disorder often have difficulties in interpersonal relationships. Emotional lability, that means very sensitive moods which vary a lot and very quickly and emotional dysregulation which means not having much control of your mood sort of genuine general sense of instability of mood which is really powerful and overwhelming very distressing distressing for the person and distressing for those around them and they don't function very well. They can't do the things they want to do and they can't, you know, however talented they might be, they just can't get it together. Now, personality disorder symptoms have to persist for two years and the irritability, impulsivity and recklessness of hypomania could also be characterized and has been characterized by some uh, psychiatrists as poorly regulated emotion and behavior. So there's a real model here and also you know, not getting on well with people and having a very negative view of yourself often overlaps with mood disorder. So you can see how these things could could blend together and get muddled up. Here's a diagram which is hard to read, but um, if I might, if you can see my arrow, you see major. See, there's hypomania. Each one is a little segment representing a mood disorder. So the top one. Let's look at this one. Major depressive episode. There's a hypomania. That's when you go up. And there's dysthymia, that's when you're low, and then there's proper depression. So there's your mood going along there, and then boom, down you go into depression, and then up you come when you get better. Very crude, I know. Now let's compare that to bipolar one. You're going along, and then you go up above hypomania into full blown mania, and then down you come again, and then you drop down below dysthymia, which is a fancy medical word for a very prolonged low mood um oh the arrow is gone and then you get down to proper depression and then you come back up again borderline personality disorder you're pretty low 
and then you get these moments of excitation and agitation. Let's go, let's disregard dysthymia for a moment. Bipolar 2, it can have proper depression, and then you come up to hypermania for short periods, and then back down to proper depression, and then up to hypermania. And cyclothymia, you're sort of um, cycling around between sort of low mood and hypomania. So it's a hard diagram to look at and understand, but it, 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 it is pretty helpful to clinicians, certainly helpful to me in my thinking. So it's thinking about diagnosis. If a person in front of you has had a manic episode which lasts seven days or more, that's probably going to be bipolar one. A less severe episode lasting about four days only, you're thinking bipolar two. Intense emotion, emotional dysregulation, even short-lived, in the context of long-standing interpersonal difficulties, you've got to consider whether this person might have a personality disorder. And if you have a patient in front of you who's not responding to depression treatment, ask them, do you ever, ever have prolonged periods of elevated mood? They might have bipolar and they might respond to a different drug. Here's some stuff from NICE. I don't think it adds anything more to what we've talked about, and I aim this at primary care physicians. So, um, and here's the stuff about psychological management. There are specialist interventions, psychological interventions, specifically for bipolar, and um, they really do help, but they're hard to get. They're really hard to get, and there's some evidence that simple group psychoeducation has some benefits, but these that's not routinely available. Uh, there's a lot of psychological therapy provided through the uh, IAP services in the NHS, but it's not directed at bipolar. It's primarily directed at depression and anxiety. So let's talk about meds because I know some of you are interested in that. How do we manage it? Well, if we have someone with bipolar one or bipolar two, we need to think about a mood stabilizer. That's you know old fashioned in the old fashioned world. It always used to be lithium. The real problems with lithium, it's a dangerous drug. It's massively dangerous in overdose. It has a very narrow therapeutic index, which for those of you who don't understand what that means, it means you have to keep it within limits. You can't go too low or it doesn't work. You can't go too high or it's poisonous. And if you get dehydrated, even a bit dehydrated, your lithium levels can rock it up. It can damage your thyroid. I could go on. Uh, an easier drug to manage is sodium valproate, which is an anti-epileptic. You don't need to do lots of blood tests for that, uh, but you mustn't take it if you might have a baby because it is teratogenic. It can really damage a fetus. Um, some other drugs that people use, lamotrigine, which is is again an, an anticonvulsant. Now, quetiapine and melanzapine, these are different sorts of drugs. These are major tranquilizers, but they're they're atypical. They're called atypical neuroleptics. They're, they're sort of second or third generation. I can't remember what generation they are. Um, and they're, they're very sedative. And olanzapine causes massive weight gain. Um, it really does. Um, you could consider giving someone with bipolar one or two and antidepressant, but you have to be careful. It's not, there's not much evidence it works. You can switch on mania. And if you're just giving them an antidepressant, you're probably not doing the right thing. And that's me for now. I'm, I'm sorry that's a whistle stop stuff and uh, maybe it would be a good idea to um, take some questions if I could. Oh, Stuart as well. I hope Stuart will help me here. Does anyone want to ask? So I can see Chinny has got a hand up. Great. Hello. Um, thank Hi, you Chini. very much for the good talk. Um, I just wonder, have you tried using topiramate or, or clonazepam as an add-on instead? I'm going to. I'm going to get. That's a Stuart question, definitely, Stuart. Uh, yeah. Well. Um, uh, the topiramate, I'm very, um, Cochrane Review in Bipolar Disorder, I am an author of, um, but it's 
it's the <laughs> which I'm so pleased and embarrassed about because I did absolutely uh, nothing about uh, other than looked at a couple of papers and it was remarkable how easy that that process was. Um, but I don't use the pyramate, um, 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 but um, um, there is a um, uh, some evidence. But I'm going to want to come back and ask you why you asked that question. But but before that, I'll try and answer it. Clonazepam, we do use. Um, uh, uh, my um, in the first experience with clonazepam in a, someone with with bipolar disorder was um, I I was in uh, my first SHO post um, out in Hexham and I went to see a lady um, who had bipolar disorder and was doing very well and was taking clonazepam and I said you don't want to be taking that benzodiazepine um, you're only going to get tolerant to it took it off her and I don't think she's ever been right since um, uh, so. Um, um, I just say uh, I don't know. It's a sort of a guilt that I carry with me and have carried with me for thirty years. Um, but um, why did you ask about to, to pyramate and clonazepam? Um, well, because of clonazepam, some, sometimes we use it. For, um, it's an anti-epileptic as well, so I thought that's why we use and um, some other anti-epileptics if they can't take valproate or lamotrigine. So if you have a patient recently, um, in patient who's allergic to lamotrigine and we cut yeah. the valproate which is still quite young so um they started yeah. on a, a, a pyramid yeah so the, uh, um so there's there's i mean i mean the, the issue that we've got the fundamental issue that we've got in bipolar disorder is we've just not got enough drugs and the ones we've got uh, and we can maybe pick this up in some of the some of the breakouts, but the ones we've got and 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 are not great. So look at bipolar depression and 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 you know, as as David said, lansipine, quetiapine, uh, a, a problematic. Um, uh, Lamotrigine is as well because apart from difficulties that your patients had, it doesn't always work. Um, so we do need to be looking at at other medications, and and often what we need to th be thinking about is is trials. Uh, you know, N of one trials as it were with individual patients. Try this, see if it works. Uh, let's do it in a careful, thought through, considered way, so that if it does work, we know as much as well as we can that it is working. Because it's actually very difficult to do that to know what's working, what's not working, and for people to look back in the past at what has and hasn't worked. But let's do that in as thoughtful a way as possible, so that we can know whether this suits you, know whether it helps you. So you can, you know, these are lifelong disorders often that we're talking about. So people can have that on or off their their uh, their list of medications. So I think I think the answer to it is I don't know. Nobody really knows, but it's worth a ga uh, worth a go if it's done uh, thoughtfully at the right time and in the right way. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. We've got two more questions which I'm going to come to. I am aware that we're not following our program. I hope this is happy with people. We will have chance for breakouts, but I'm being a bit flexible with our timetable. So Matthew and then Sonia. Um, thanks, uh, David, for that really good um, kind of presentation. Um, I did put up a question in the chat when you oh, were sorry. About the, just about the um, the kind of uh, DSM and ICD-10 classifications of things. Does it include episodes that are provoked by other illicit substances or antidepressants? Because um, we see that a lot in secondary <laughs> services, people come into hospital, they've taken whatever. Um, and, you know, is that just a, a provoked episode or are they more likely to go on to have a bipolar disorder of one type or another? That's a really good question. And Stuart, over to you again. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I was slightly distracted because I was I knew I was supposed to be checking the chat and I hadn't been doing so. So I was I was on that. Um, but what you said is if people become manic uh, uh, after taking have an ECT or taking medication or taking something illicit, does does that uh, make them bipolar or not? Um, and and it does look like um, people who experience a manic or hypermanic episode after ECT or after antidepressants look more like bipolar patients in the sense than than resistant than depression patients in the sense that they uh, tend to have a stronger family history uh, and they tend to be at increased risk of future manic uh, episodes. So I think it is worth um, managing people who have had a manic episode um, regardless of what, what's behind, of whether or not it was driven by um, antidepressant treatment as bipolar. The complication in your question was about people who are manic with 
uh, stimulants. Um, and then it just becomes a very sort of diagnostic thing is, is this, a, you know, is this a manic episode or is this just, you know, a direct and immediate response to the, to the cocaine or the amphetamine? Um, but if it persists beyond the duration of the cocaine or the amphetamine, then it's worth thinking it, about it as being a manic episode. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Helpful. Sonia? Yeah, I wondered what you felt about lorazodone because we've had uh, three people and we've had really, really good eff effects with lorazodone. We we've had to go through a big application process to use it in our trust because I think the evidence, there's a little bit of evidence maybe in America, but certainly like no license here. But because of like the weight gain, when we go to talk to patients, it does rule out a lot of, especially like female, younger female patients, it rules out a lot of the treatment. And really lorazodone was like the only option we had left. And, and like, all three who were people that come in and out of hospital a lot, I, I haven't, they might have gone to another site, <laughs> but I haven't see, seen them back since we put them on. Uh, we're, we're so short of beds, they might well have gone to, <laughs> like Matt might have seen them somewhere. But, uh, I, I'm up for that one as well. I don't want to sort of be just pushing in, David, but I'm up for the lorazodone question as well. Uh, yeah, the evidence. I mean, if you look at the evidence, Sonia, for for lorazodone, it's beautiful, um, and it's like nothing else. Um, uh, and um, um, and like you say, the side effect profile is so much better uh, than the other drugs that we have. Uh, so I think it's it's really one that's that's um, that's worth um, uh, thinking about. The the dosing of it is is interesting because uh, we we come to medication with a um, a preconception that more is better, you know, um, but it doesn't seem to be necessarily with lorazodone. Uh, it can be that, that the lower doses. So if thinking about bipolar depression, the lower doses, um, which is the case with lots of drugs, and we can talk about the pharmacology behind this. Um, uh, the lower doses seem to increase dopamine flow a little bit more and can be more activated, activating. So those sort of um, uh, uh, 18, 35 milligram doses can be more effective than, than the higher doses sometimes. Um, but yeah, um, it's it's good and it's good that you've formulated a lot of uh, been through it and thought through it because I think it's um, it's a valuable treatment option. We, it's like it's still new, so we need to 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 see it and see how well it works uh, in action um, in our own hands. But it um, it you know the evidence is good for it. We like it in the mood sort of service where I work. That's great. Thanks. Can we move on? Have you got small slides, Stuart? Or no? Is there a second half, or is that is that? No, it? he's he's there to do the tricky questions like he's just done. OK, so in that case, we can move to our breakout discussion. Um, I think we'll have three groups um, and Michelle, who I hope is, is still on the call, is going to divide everybody up. Um, there'll be one of the organising team within each group, or at least one. Um, but we would like somebody who's not from the sort of organising team of David, Ian, Stuart, myself, Tom, and Kathy to report back um, rather than you're listening to our voices all the time. So the first breakout discussion, and I think we said we'd have 15 minutes. So if it's OK, we, we will do that. What are the challenges experienced by people with bipolar disorder? And what are the challenges for healthcare professionals who are providing care? So it's really to think about what David's talked around earlier in terms of the diagnostic difficulties, people accessing care, people getting a diagnosis, people getting on the right treatment. Um, so if we can spend, actually, I think, Michelle, if we spend about 12 minutes on that and then we'll bring everybody back and we'll have a feedback. And if we can feedback one key point from each group, if that's OK, so a key challenge either from the patient perspective or from a healthcare professional perspective. We're all back, that's fantastic. So I'm going to um, ask, I'm going to pick somebody, I think, unless Michelle, could you, have you got one, two and three? So could you just call somebody's name out from group one and then they can decide who's gonna feed that back. And remember, it's one key challenge um, to feedback. OK, we've got group one, Matthew Croft. OK, Matthew, that's our group. And he, yeah. he's good feedback. Yeah, um, so 
in our group we talked a bit about um, when's the right time to review medication. Um, often people with bipolar end up getting um, medication changed when they're poorly and going into hospital or having a relapse. Um, but um, how much choice do they have at that moment and how much insight do they have about you know, what medicines they're likely to be taking for a longer time? Um, and is there a way we can kind of review medicines when people are more stable um, and actually engage them in that discussion in a, uh, a better way? It's probably, I think, a summary. Yeah, and the role of the pharmacist oh, yeah. in facilitating that, I think, was, was key. So thank you. Great. It's, it's, it's Sarah next, but, but I'm just concerned we've got more than one. Can, can she be allowed to give you more than one, Caroline? You didn't say, you didn't tell us we were restricted to one at the time. <laughs> so is this group two? Are you group group two, two, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you're supposed to give one, but if you, if you can give two key I'll challenges keep it. at the time. I'll keep it brief, don't you worry. Do. Um, so yeah, we got some really useful feedback from Liz. Um, so I think uh, it's mainly about patient um, kind of centred care. So one of the first challenges we identified was um, the actual initial approach to primary care clinicians. So it would maybe useful for them to have a little bit more training in terms of um, bipolar as a condition and how best to treat to kind of deal with these people and, and treat these people on initial presentation. Um, and after that, we discussed kind of the stigma around the diagnosis and how long it actually takes to have this diagnosis. And in the interim, how many kind of issues can present there as well and how difficult it can make um, a patient's life um, before they actually get that final diagnosis. Um, and then we also talked about um, the sharing of um, information. So um, especially for young adults um, who, you know, may, may have very concerned family members, but also just in general, I think to put in some initial implementation in terms of sharing of information between patients and family. Um, obviously, that isn't always possible, but just having that conversation um, at the kind of beginning of care so that we can just make sure that there's an open line and that everyone's aware of what's happening so that they can support that person better. Um, and also the sharing of information between hospitals and GP surgeries. Fantastic. Thank you. And your first point about the diagnostic delay is going to be covered by Cathy in her presentation shortly. So really good segue um and then lastly group three michelle who's uh, ruth please so whoever's in ruth's group to feedback yeah um i don't mind feeding back potentially the the second bit so in terms of from a professional perspective um i think we looked at both from a secondary care and a primary care perspective so if i discuss from a primary care, I think the conclusion we come to, it's very difficult to get a correct diagnosis in primary care, because in order to do that, you need a good comprehensive history. Who in primary care has the opportunity to get a good comprehensive history? Um, and then, you know, in terms of, the, you know, would a patient present necessarily when they're in a manic episode? Probably not. Um, so I think it's that those are some of the challenges that we spoke about, particularly within primary care. I don't know if anybody else wants to chip in for the first point from a patient perspective, or do you want me to carry on? No, that's fine. I think you know the, the having the time to take a clear history and knowing what what to ask about, I think, is perhaps not always those skills aren't always possessed by primary care clinicians. Um, and again, I think it links nicely into Catherine's presentation. Lovely. OK, so I'm going to introduce Cathy Morgan, who is a researcher at the University of Manchester and is going to talk to us about some work she's done on bipolar disorder and particularly on diagnose, diagnosis. OK, thanks, Carolyn. Um, I'll be presenting some findings funded by the NIH uh, Research for Patient Benefit and Greater Manchester Patient Safety Translational Research Centre, which was a collaboration between Manchester University and Kew University. And we looked into identifying early signals prior to bipolar disorder diagnosis in a UK primary care cohort. 
So just as a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about, um, I'm going to give a brief epidemiology and impact of bipolar disorder, um, how sort of those signals have been identified already on, in undiagnosed bipolar disorder, some aims and brief methods, some key results because it generated lots of results, um, the summary of those strengths and limitations and the potential clinical impact of the, of the, the work. So we know, uh, as we've heard, um, bipolar disorder is characterised by mean, mood instability. It's got a lifetime prevalence between one um, to three to seven percent, with a peak age range of onset of type one and two uh, of 15 to 25 years. And globally, it's the fourth most disabling condition in those aged under 25 years of age. Um, so previous work um, report an estimated average delay in diagnosis of just under six years. So untreated symptoms over long periods have an impact on the individuals. And as we heard, there's um, an increased risk of mortality with reports that during that undiagnosed phase, individuals are seven times more at risk of suicide and increased risk of other comorbid conditions. There's potentially difficulties in social um, adjustment and increased hospital admissions, and also, as we've heard, in a, inappropriate therapy. So despite this, um, these poor outcomes, the current screening tools um, have varied performance within the different healthcare settings to identify bipolar disorder. And there's concerns for high rates of misclassification for both over and under diagnosing. And um, most studies using these tools are rarely performed within a primary care setting. Um, but there are, there are unknown, that there are uh, possible unknown symptoms or patterns of symptoms that we could pick up um, to indicate unrecognised bipolar disorder. Um, but we're unclear as to the frequency an individual may present to a GP with these symptoms. Previous studies have relied on individual recall and and not used um, systematically identified cohorts. So within the UK, we've got this great resource, the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, and it's one of the largest databases of electronic patient medical records covering about 7% of the UK population. And it's representative of age, gender and ethnicity. And it captures GP consultations, recording symptoms, diagnoses, present, uh, prescribed medications and referrals to secondary services. And it can also be linked um, with hospital episodes, statistics, HES, the uh, Office of National Statistics to give um, death registrations, and also the indices of multiple deprivation to give uh, a proxy of social economic status. So with this in mind, we use the CPRD and the HES data and we hope to uh, identify symptoms and signs of emerging and undiagnosed bipolar disorder uh, by comparing healthcare contacts in people with a disorder to those without. And this including psychotropic medication prescribing, mental health symptoms and diagnosis and health service engagement. So for instant incident cases, we identified those from the records using read codes or for the secondary care data ICD-10 codes. And we found the first recorded event, which had to fall between January 2010 and July 2017. And we termed this the index date. And with the control, uh, the case patients, we um, matched with 20 controls by age, gender and practice. And these didn't have um, a bipolar event before that matched index date. So the healthcare events included psychotropic medication, some diagnoses of mental health issues, um, behaviour symptoms such as mood swings and sleep disturbance, and service interactions, including number of consultations and those number of patients that um, uh, stopped attending scheduled appointments. And these were drawn from previous literature and also um, from an advisory board panel meeting, including service users, carers, GPs and psychiatrists. And the records were identified in year bands before diagnosis. 
So for each symptom and healthcare event, we calculated the annual episode incidence. So these are in effect incident cases within that year period before diagnosis. And this would allow us to see any elevation in um, incidence that's um, in those symptoms and where it occurred in relation to the timing of diagnosis. And we also calculated odds ratios, which gives the indication of the association of the odds of a bipolar di disorder diagnosis given that symptom event compared to an individual without that symptom event. So, for example, if you have an odds ratio of five, this indicates um, for a person with that symptom is five times more often to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder to someone without that symptom event. And the odds ratios were calculated in periods of one, two, five and ten years. So this is the characteristics of the cohort. There were just under 2,400 bipolar cases and um, just over uh, 47,000 controls, of which 40% were male and 60% were female, with an average mean age of 40 years at index date. And there's approximately 20% resided in each quintile of the social deprivation in cases, with a lower proportion of controls residing in the more deprived areas. So looking at the prescription data, and I'll only um, present sort of key results here. Um, not surprisingly, both antidepressants and antipsychotics were much more widely prescribed. Um, and just to note the high incidence of antidepressant prescribing with both around um, eight to six years before the index date of increased incidence. And in, in all of the psychotropic prescribing, there was an increased odds of receiving um, a bipolar disorder diagnosis if they were um, prescribed that medication. So for individuals prescribed an antidepressant at five years before index date, they're eight times more likely to receive a subsequent bipolar disorder diagnosis, four times for benzodiazepines and six times for Z drugs. Um, we also looked into the number of psychotropic medication classes prescribed. So counting within a year, those prescribed three or more different categories of medications during that year. And we found an elevated uh, um, incident increase incidence from about eight years before index date. So this could be a useful trigger for clinicians if an individual is prescribed three or more different medication classes within that year. So looking at mental health diagnoses, um, we found that indication of depression and symptoms of depression, as we've heard, um, increased rates from six years before index date with a high instance even before 10 years. And the rates of uh, anxiety disorders were also elevated, but less marked than depression. And when we looked at other disorders, we found individuals at five years before index dates with a diagnostic code in their electronic health record of a personality disorder or schizophrenia were 28 and 26 times more often to receive a subsequent bipolar disorder diagnosis compared to those without. So potentially misdiagnosis or this, this blurring of lines um, that was spoken about earlier. And then looking at behaviour symptoms, so mood swings, self-harm and suicidal ideation and sleep disturbance. We found that although the lower incidence compared to other diagnosis and um, medication prescribing, there were um, mood swings with notably elevated um, within the two years before the index date. So a later um, symptom. Um, and possibly this is indicate that mood swings may not be reported early enough, like we talked about, and um, that a, a clinician's inquiry into those mood swings earlier would be beneficial. Um, sleep disturbance showed an increase in incidence in long periods before diagnostic code. And although this isn't on its own a reliable indicator, with other triggers, this may be um, a, an essential marker to consider bipolar disorder diagnosis. And then other behavioural indicators of interest included self-harm and suicidal ideation, where an individual 
um, where it was recorded in their notes as early as 10 years before the index date uh, were eight times more often uh, later diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So service interactions. So we found a significant difference between those with bipolar disorder and, their, and the controls in terms of the median number of consultations per year prior to index date. So at five years before index date, the median number of consultations was eight for bipolar disorder and four for controls. Again, another useful flag for um, GPs. Um, those missing six or more scheduled appointments consorting for any reason in a year recording at five years were over four times more often to receive a bipolar diagnosis than those missing fewer appointments. So another trigger uh, to consider there. So in summary, we found potentially useful collective signals to monitor, um, to monitor primary care, including depressive episodes, um, escalating patterns of self-harm, this early inquiry into sleep disturbance and mood swings, and also polypharmacy of psychotrophic medication prescription, and notable increases in face-to-face uh, -face consultations and non-attendance. Um, to our knowledge, this is the first study to identify the frequency and timing of possible detectable signals of undiagnosed bipolar disorder. And one of the huge strengths of this data is that it's already captured routinely in primary care. And also the nature of the data meant that we could incorporate health service interactions like GP consultations and missed appointments, and also have a wealth of this psychotrophic medication records data. But there are limitations. Uh, we are um, reliant on the coding by GPs, so some may have been classified, misclassified, or inconsistencies with the choice of read codes. Um, although we, we did have a range of very fine codes through our medical teams and used um, both primary and secondary care codes to ascertain the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. We also found that one of the strongest risk factors, the family history of mental health, wasn't effectively captured within primary care, so we couldn't actually use this within our analysis. So in conclusion, um, we think we found potentially useful additions to screening tools to further improve specificity of bipolar disorder within primary care. Um, and it gives the opportunity to, wear, um, to raise awareness among GPs to improve the under recognition and possible misdiagnosis of bipolar disorder. And this might be improved by increasing um, the monitoring of the lesser known and non-specific signals of bipolar um, disorder and increase the frequency, um, such as if inquiry into mood, sleep, and the opportunities for this um, family history of mental health to be recorded. And there may also be the potential of the use of primary care electronic health records to use as a prompt to recognise these signals cumulatively and trigger further assessment. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the funders again and a huge thank you to our lived experience advisory panel supported by the MIPIN Foundation uh, and the advisory board of service users and healthcare professionals and the support I also received from fellow colleagues for code lists. OK, thank you. Thank you so much, Cathy, for, for that. Uh, really good presentation, really clear. We've got some questions. I've got Stuart and then David. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. That was really interesting. I, I just wonder what. Oh, let me put my camera on. I wonder whether you had the opportunity to uh, look at this uh, the other way, uh, if that makes sense. So you've been able to show really very nicely that uh, people who have a um, uh, an, a, a bipolar index event are more likely to have had a diagnosis of PD, three or more drugs. A, um, depression, self-harm. Um, what could is it possible to follow those things forward? So to say, of people who are prescribed three or more different classes of psychotropics or who have a diagnosis of PD, how many of those go on to develop bipolar disorder? Because that I, I suspect if 
if that's a, a reasonably high figure, then that becomes even more interesting for GPs and even more of an important flag, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know why we've not thought of that. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that would be really powerful, wouldn't it, to, uh, to actually indicate how many individuals that, that affects. So something I could quite easily look into. Thank you for that, Stuart. Yeah, we need to take that back to our group, don't we? Yeah. Do you want to stop sharing, Cathy? Uh, Dave... Oh, sorry, sorry. Right, do you want... David, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Um, isn't it interesting that in the drug, prescribing drugs graph, mood stabilizers were prescribed in the year preceding the diet. What were they doing? Yeah. Anyway, that raises so, questions. Yeah, so we did have a few, I mean, obviously that was noted by some of the psychiatrists and GPs, and we think there's possibly a delay thing going on there in terms yeah. of the reporting. Um, yeah. But the fact that we were still picking it up quite, uh, you know, far okay. before the index date. Anyway, I just wanted to say something which I thought might be useful to you. First of all, I thought that was great, and this is potentially a really useful thing uh, for GPs. And a colleague of mine, um, Sarah Sullivan in Bristol, has developed an algorithm looking at which sort of generates a likelihood of developing uh, a psychotic illness it's sort of aimed at early intervention. And I just wonder whether this sort of data could be used in a similar way. I mean, obviously, GPs inundated with endless warnings to ask. But, you know, if it gets you asking the right questions, it's got to be a good idea. Yeah, that's so, right. I mean, yeah. certainly from our um, user group of GPs, I mean, I remember one GP coming back to me saying that's changed what I actually ask a patient in really simple terms, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, and, and prompt to ask about family history, I think, was something that we discussed, didn't we? That perhaps we hadn't, as the GPs and the, the stakeholder group hadn't thought about family history, hadn't, rec you know, weren't recording it, but actually realised from this it's so important. Mm -hmm. Matthew's called it Q risk for SMI. Sarah calls her as P risk. Yeah. And I mean, this could be merged with Sarah to give you a, a, P, a, 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 a better P risk. I mean, I, I don't know. Where are you published, Catherine? Is this published yet? No, it's, it's not. Published it's just, yet. it's nearly there to publish, yeah. I want to see, I want to know more when it's published, please. Okay. We'll let you know. And I think taking your hints about perhaps contacting Sarah. Yeah, yeah. To, uh, She's yeah. just got a grant to develop yeah. this work and test this yeah. work. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any other questions before we move on to the, the breakout room? So I've allocated again 15 minutes um, and really it's a, a fairly straightforward question in the, this next breakout room. Trying to define the next research priority or the next research question around bipolar disorder. And again, if we can feed back um, the, the one key question or priority from each group. OK, so I'll, I'll briefly feed back. So I guess probably the main thing we talked about was um, I was quite interested in Cathy's um, the three markers, the three classes of psychotropic drugs. And one of the things we talked about was whether you could have like a pharmacy technician working in because they're based in GP surgeries now. Um, they could kind of do a desk screen of prescription records and identify people at risk of bipolar and then take that to a team meeting. Um, and we, possibly you could do some exploratory feasibility type work. Does that summarise it, Carolyn? Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, if the rest of the group are happy with that. Uh, we certainly thought we could see a, a, pa a patient pathway through the practice to, to perhaps bring people in um, for more formal assessment. Yeah, so thank you. Group two. Um, yeah, we had a discussion around what we believed um, should be implemented, but we didn't get to a question. Um, so we we kind of discussed around um, the role of the pharmacy technician within services and how they do a really important job in counselling patients, um, especially after their inpatient stay on their medications, which can obviously help with you know 
adherence to their medications and just basic understanding of why they're taking their medications. Um, so this kind of made us think about whether having somebody that a patient um, almost like a befriender but with some background in health related activities so a HCA preferably um, could follow up with patients um, post discharge just to make sure that they I guess are happy with everything that's happening in terms specifically in terms of their medications I think is what we discussed but I guess potentially around other social things as well like um, life after inpatient stays um, and looking at whether that actually would make a difference and um, we believe that it would so um, we did discuss it could maybe be a randomized control trial but also it could just be something that we try and implement in services um, to I guess just make patients um, you know life's easier and better um, in the long run. Yeah, so an implementation study rather than an RCT. Yeah. With lots of process evaluation work around. Right, thank you. Yeah, so I think this again illustrates the role of thinking about the broader skill mix and, and crossover, you know, interface between primary and, and secondary care, which is, you know, sometimes there's a chasm rather than an interface. So thank you for that. And group three. So we, we discussed about um, developing a screening tool, a, a simple tool that could be used and then like auditing that and testing that out. And then also um, maybe to do some research for the role of um, mental health practitioners in primary care and their, like if they could be involved in diagnosis. OK, that's great. So again, the primary secondary interface. And uh, yes, and I, I mean, I think Kathy, I don't know whether you feel we're probably too early to think about a, a tool um, based on the work we've done so far, but um, we need to have a look at Sarah Sullivan's work to see where she's up to, I think. OK, so thank you very much, everybody. So I've got some questions which I will put on the my feedback to SPCR and they will appear on the um, when, when this is publicly available um, as a webinar. Just wondering if we can in the last few minutes go around and just make sure that if you've got any outstanding questions, particularly for uh, Kathy, Stuart or David, if you've got any reflections on today um, and what you've got out of it. So um, I'm going to just go around my screen as you appear and I still can't see everybody as named. So um, if I miss you out, put your hand up. Sonia. Yeah, I think it's been very useful. It's sort of opened my eyes to kind of um, some of the work that's going on. I have to say what um, I'm really surprised about is the fact that um, that sort of GPs aren't really recording the, the history of the family, because that's something in, in um, secondary care when people are admitted, we would take a very big history and would use that for diagnosis. So I kind of assumed probably that the GPs had that information and that would be used when they were reviewing patients that were presenting with with sort of symptoms of, of mental health? So I think there's two things. One is not all GPs will take that full history. But the other thing is we might put it into the narrative, into free text. And so you can't then pick it up when you do a study using CPRD because it's, it appears in free text. So I'm fully aware of when I take when I talk to somebody and um, with mental health problems, I will put a family history in, but I put it in as free text, which is no use to CPRD studies. And I apologise to Cathy. Cathy, <laughs> any reflections from you? I just think it's great that I've managed to meet people from primary care, mental health, um, practitioner, nurse, secondary care. And it seems to just even thinking about research in general has married those up, you know, um, so yeah, roll on the next study. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, it's uh, these breakout room rooms have been uh, fabulous. I think particularly um, in relation to kind of research and what comes next. And I think I'm maybe ch going to change my research question again, <laughs> following <laughs> the um, hearing about Kathy's work, particularly really. Um, and working as a mental health practitioner within primary care, really, that that needs looking at and 
that could be an area for further kind of evaluation really you know we're three years in now and it's not been evaluated um so yeah i think there's a real opportunity there so i want to thank you for you know this opportunity to have these discussions well thanks to the spcl for funding this but they'll be really pleased if if they think that one research question has come out of a workshop and has been taken forward liz any reflections from you uh, yes, uh, thank you. I um, was one of the LEAP members and met Kathy, of course, and yourself those years uh, years back. So interesting to see how far we've come with that. So uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, uh, come on to this, um, this group today and uh, giving uh, I miss them to give some contribution. Uh, very interesting what you everyone's doing. Um, thank you. Thank you, Liz, for, for sparing your time. We really appreciate it. Matthew. Yeah, um, really interesting webinar. Um, certainly giving us some things to think about how we might do it in secondary care. Unfortunately, our access to data is nowhere near as good as primary care. Um, we can't really report on things um, in the same way, but um, yeah, certainly some interesting things to think about. Thank you, Chinny. Um, hi, I uh, get my camera on. <laughs> yes, it's uh, it's it's very it's very interesting. I like I like the discussion that we had in the breakout rooms. Um, uh, unfortunately, I've missed part of Kathy's talk because we had an emergency on the ward, so um, I came back into the room a bit lost. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's good to meet everyone from different you know, secondary care, primary care, you know. And you will be able to see the slides when the webinar goes up onto SBCR website. So the slides will be included in that, Ginny. Okay, thank you. Ade. Um, I found the breakout sessions useful as well as the presentation as well. Um, David Kessler's, um, the, the chart he showed uh, on you know on the different uh, <laughs> bipolar one two cyclothermic and dysthermic that's very very good and um, here in Scotland um, I think the GPs are, are are not as involved in terms of you know diagnosing mental health conditions I think the only one that they could confidently diagnose is depression. <laughs> So my colleague was saying that antidepressants or SSRIs are like uh, smarties here. So, but um, CMHT post for pharmacists is a developing role. So from this discussion now, I think I would take, you know, forward to my team the where, you know, the pharmacist could, you know, support the CMHT team. So if patients, especially in terms of medication review, because sometimes you know, when they're seen by psychiatrists, they are probably seen once a year and no one probably goes back to look at the history from five years previous. So a pharmacist might be better placed to do that yearly medication review and maybe refer on iris patients that have not been diagnosed with, you know, bipolar uh, disorder, you know, to the, to the mental health team. Thanks, Ade. And I've got Linfoot J. Sorry, your, your first name's not showing. Hi, yeah. Um, so my name's Jodie. Um, oh, and I'm a ph pharmacy technician. Um, no, it's been really helpful, obviously, listening to the different research and information that can I can get from this. Um, and yeah, it'd be interesting to take things back to try and develop the roles in in which we're doing the community now. So thank you. And S. McCartney, again, I apologise because the team has not shown me a first name. Yeah, sorry, that's me, um, Sarah. So, yeah, thank you so much to everybody. Um, this has been really informative for me and it's just really exciting to hear about, you know, the work that's being done. Kathy, yourself, your research sounds amazing and the research as well that you were talking about um, with the P risk too. Um, it's just great to hear that this is all happening. Um, and it's also really reassuring for me to get a better understanding of um, the differences between these conditions because it is something that I wanted to develop my knowledge on. So it's been really great for that as well. Um, so thanks for all the discussions that we had today.
That's great, thank you. And then I'm going to ask um, David, Stuart, Tom, Ian, if they've got any final reflections, and Cathy, if you've got any final reflections. Yeah, I wanted to say, I've learned, a, I mean, a lot, but a couple of things. I Just listening to Liz in the breakout group, I just, it brought home to me how important it is to make a good diagnosis as early as possible. Um, and, the, and, and you can't do that. You can't have good care unless you've got that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the first thing I thought of. And then listening to 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 Kathy, I just thought that was a really helpful study of thinking about how we might improve our diagnosis in primary care. So I, I hope Kathy and and colleagues, you can do something with that. And perhaps uh, we've already said enough about that. But those are the two things that I was putting together in my head. Great, thank you. Stuart? Yeah, um, just joyous to get together really in, in this kind of way in different groups to how we normally do and, and to think things through. And and fabulous um, to hear the people from pharmacy, different pharmacy staff talking about the work that's done and, and Adidiki there, the, you know, the potential for uh, developing roles and, and doing things better and doing things different is um, uh, is tremendous. Ian? I mean, I thought it's been really good. I've just got a couple of things. I mean, um, I think it's, there's so many pharmacists here, which I think plays to the fact that the NIHR is trying to build pharmacy led research. So you might want to hide that in the, in the report, um, Carolyn. But it's then how the NIHR, the NHS, and academia can support all the pharmacists on this call and pharmacy techs mm. who want to start developing research mm. and want to become research leaders. And it's how we do that as a challenge. I thought Kathy's work was really good. It needs a wide audience, including a, a wide pharmacy audience. Mm. And it would be good for more pharmacists to hear it, definitely. But thank you very much. Thanks. Kathy? Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for the opportunity of sharing the work and um, yeah I, and encouraging me to get it published and the next stage um, and all your input um, I've, I've really appreciated it thank you I've really enjoyed the day thanks Tom yeah just to echo what everyone else has said really I think it's been a great workshop really good presentations and the opportunity to discuss things in the breakout rooms has been really helpful as well in terms of my own learning um, but probably the best way to learn isn't it by interacting in those small group settings and um, so grateful to the members of the group that I was involved with. Thanks and Michelle um, do you have any reflections before we just do a bit of housekeeping? Only just to think to say I think it's been a really good workshop as in there's been a big a good mixture of slides and information and time for discussions as well, which I think is really useful. I think it's good to talk about the things that have been presented. So well done, everybody. <laughs> well, thank you for helping to put it all together, because without your technical support, I would be rubbish. Um, I think people will be sent an evaluation form and um, for those people who have uh, Coming with their lived experience, there is some reimbursement from School for Primary Care Research. So make sure that you get that sorted out. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, it's five to one. So I think we can say we've done our two hours worth. Really, really grateful for everybody to um, for attending, for participating, for giving some great ideas. Hopefully you will have developed some links. And um, thank you very much. It's lunchtime. So take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.